Thank you very much for inviting me to speak to this conference. Um, I have the honour to be a member of the Wentworth Group of Concerned Scientists. Uh, we're concerned scientists, not just scientists. We're concerned because we care about certain things and we think science has a major contribution to make to making those things better. Um, and it's from that context I'd like to talk to you today. What is failure and what is success? Following on from what John was saying, failure is where governments, both our own and around the world, make promises they either neither intended to keep or, to be a little bit more kind, made promises that have not been implemented because they are too difficult to keep. At the Rio Conference on Sustainable Development, that's the original one 20 years ago, not the one this week, the world's leaders, including Australia, great, made grand promises. We were going to save the world's biodiversity and we were going to stop climate change. Instead, what have we got? In Australia, we have a federal government backed by an opposition who are seeking to wind back environmental laws so that we can dig up more stuff to make more things we don't need. And the same government, backed by the same opposition, that thinks a 5% emission reduction target is a big thing. We're suffering a crisis of confidence here in Australia and around in the Western world because people no longer trust their governments to protect their interests. Be under no illusions though, we live in a democracy. Governments reflect us, they are elected by us. So where do we sit, the so-called experts? What is our role in society today and how can we turn what is currently failure into success? Science has played a fundamental role in getting big environmental issues into the public agenda. No IPCC, no climate change knowledge, and therefore no reason to act on policy. There are many people in this conference that have played a most fundamental role in bringing science of climate change into public policy. We are suffering a crisis of confidence in our leaders because we now realise that the promises are easy to make and much harder to implement. We have been seduced by the headlines and we have failed to follow through. This is our modern disease and it applies across the political spectrum, not just in climate change. And we are in for a long and painful road ahead. After decades of financial mismanagement, the European economy is in meltdown, the US is in denial, and we are simply suffering a crisis of political leadership here in Australia, despite our overwhelming economic success. So where does that leave us? What role now for science? What can we do to turn promises into policies that actually fix the, pro the problems the promises are meant to fix? More than ever, society needs and is seeking out experts. Experts who are prepared not to just write elegant papers in fancy scientific journals, but experts who are prepared to share their knowledge with society and defend science when it is being junked by vested interests. And it is hard. There are a lot of people at this conference who are highly capable and courageous defenders of science who do stand up and defend science. And they will tell you how hard it is to do that. But we need more of you, more than ever, to stand up behind them, because if you walk it away now, we will fail. The greatest failure will be if we give up on society. Because if we do, society will give up on us. Failure will be where science fails to stand up when it is most needed. So what is success? Success is where promises are turned into good laws and good laws change the world. And you only get good laws 
if they are crafted by experts who take advice from experts. And good laws will only change the world if experts then get in there and help those people on the ground working day to day to try and implement those policies. Science has been very good at informing policy, but we are terrible at staying the distance and making sure that policies turn into outcomes. Too often we tick the box and wander, wander off into some other interesting subject and leave the implementation to someone else. There is no someone else. Despite everything, here in Australia, we do have some good laws. So in the context of this conference on climate change adaptation, what are these good laws and how do we make them work? Let me start with the reality of the circumstances we find ourselves in. And that is despite the most significant collective contribution of science to an issue of enormous public policy, on the balance of probabilities, political inaction means that it is now almost certain that we will not limit global warming to two degrees. The world leaders promised they would, but the reality is they did not. On the balance of probabilities, we are facing a world of three degrees or more above pre-industrial levels in the lifetime of most people alive today. On the balance of probabilities, the next generation will face significant changes to the world's ecosystems because whilst our generation has accepted the science, it has failed to act in time. Science tells us that two degrees is a threshold to dangerous climate change. Some scientists believe that several critical aspects of ecosystem function collapse after we reach two and a half degrees. So whatever mitigation action the world takes from here, we must also begin the process of adaptation. We also know that the more we mitigate and the faster we mitigate, the less we will encounter. Reality two is more positive. Australia, on Sunday, will have a price on carbon. A good price. Our targets are modest, but so are those of the rest of the world. The important point is that after 20 years of promises, however it happened, we are now making a start because people accepted the science. Reality number three. We also have a policy framework, one that is well designed to adapt as our ambitions increase. It is a good policy. It drives down emissions, it sequesters carbon in vegetation and soils, and it is structured to enable us to maximise the multiple environmental, social and economic benefits of carbon offsets. So let me focus on the issue of climate change adaptation from the perspective of both landscape conservation and climate change adaptation, because the two are bound together. I want to make three points, three very simple but fundamental points on which to move forward in turning good policy into good outcomes. Firstly, biodiversity is carbon. Life on Earth is based on carbon. We, it, store carbon. We are carbon. Secondly, healthy landscapes store more carbon than degraded landscapes, and healthier landscapes are more able to adapt to change than degraded landscapes. And thirdly, the European-based agricultural practices we brought to this continent 200 years ago have both degraded landscapes and mined our soils of carbon. So in addressing both mitigation and adaptation, well-designed policies to store carbon in the landscape is without question a no-regrets option for Australia. In other words, even without the need for climate mitigation or adaptation, we will be a more prosperous society if we do it anyway. Indeed, it may prove to be the one opportunity our generation has to create an economy that conserves nature rather than one that destroys it. How much carbon can we store in our landscapes? 
and how much good will it do? Well, the answer to this question all depends on three things. Firstly, the carbon price needs to be higher than the cost of restoration and the opportunity cost of alternative land uses. But let me give you some ballpark figures on the phenomenal scale of this opportunity. On a global scale, a 15% increase in the world's terrestrial carbon bank would remove the equivalent of all the carbon pollution emitted from fossil fuels since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. CSIRO, in a landmark report, estimated that the Australian landscape has the biophysical potential to store an additional 1,000 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent in soils and vegetation each and every year for the next 40 to 50 years. If we could capture just 15% of this biophysical potential, it would offset the equivalent of 25% of Australia's current greenhouse gas emissions. And in the process, this would fundamentally transform our landscapes. Secondly, and this is partially linked to the first, our land use regulations and economic incentives need to guide the carbon offsets economy into areas of greatest benefit and, the, and away from areas that cause further damage. A free market in carbon offsets will almost certainly not deliver healthy and productive landscapes. It will drive investments into monoculture plantations and in many parts of Australia will further deplete environmental flows in already over-allocated river systems. Thirdly, regulations need to be based on good regional natural resource management plans. And fourthly, good plans can only be created if we have environmental accounts that can measure the condition of our environmental assets and monitor changes in their condition over time. It is a disgrace that after 20 years of state of environment reporting in this country, we still have no system in place that gives the most fundamental information on the condition of our environmental assets. If you don't measure it, how can you possibly hope to manage it? Now, if we got all these things completely right, carbon, market, carbon offsets market would transform the Australian landscape. So, what is failure? Failure is to assume that because we have a good law, all these things will just magically appear. Experience over the past 20 years warns us that without determined and concentrated effort, at every step of the way, it simply will not happen. Our challenge, your challenge, is to not drift off into some other interesting scientific subject, because if you do, nothing will change. The new terrestrial carbon economy, implemented well, based on sound science, provides financial incentives to reduce emissions and store carbon in our land. It is also an opportunity to rehabilitate degraded land and, and build resilient landscapes. But only if we stick with it and only if we make sure good policy becomes real outcomes. So let me conclude with what I was saying at the beginning. 20 years ago, the world leaders, including Australia, made grand promises. We were going to save the world's biodiversity and we were going to stop climate change. Instead, in Australia, we have got a federal government backed by the opposition winding back environmental laws and the same government backed by the same opposition that thinks a 5% emission reduction is a big thing. We are in for a long and painful road. Failure is where governments, both ours and around the world, make promises they never, that they either never intended to keep or made promises that have not been implemented because they were too hard. So where does that leave us? What is the role for science? What can we do to turn promises into policies that actually fix the problems? More than ever, society needs voices of reason. Experts who are prepared not to just write papers, but experts who are prepared to share their knowledge with society and defend science when it is being junked by vested interests. 
This is the hard bit. But if you walk away now, we will fail. Failure is where science fails to stand up when it is most needed. As I said, there are a great many leaders who are highly capable and courageous defenders of science, many of whom have been at this conference today and the last few days. More than ever, they need you to stand up behind them and with them. The greatest failure will be if we give up on society, because if we do, society will give up on us. Thank you.